My question is, is purely for clarification on the status of Israel. Um, so Israel has signed but not ratified. And I was wondering, because I, well, I, as I understand it, it makes it, it allows them to be an observer at the OPCW. So has Israel already done any preparatory work uh, on, for example, preparations for implementation of regulation? Um, does it, did it do anything towards ratifying um, the treaty? Um, and uh, already somewhat more leading question is like, w uh, what would be the incentive for Israel to make that step? I, if it's already allowed to be an observer as because it's signed, uh, what would it still have to win by ratifying, except for getting a lot of stuff that it would have to do? Um, mine is a uh, a comment and a question, I guess. I think the um, diplomats understanding science better, I think, is something which we've come across a lot, which, uh, yeah, is definitely something that needs room for improvement, I think. Um, but, yeah, on the status of Iraq, there's been a lot of coverage in the New York Times recently on uh, abandoned ordnance, so not large stockpiles, but just uh, abandoned ordnance throughout the country of chemical weapons. What is there within the CWC uh, when it comes to assistance mechanisms for cleaning up and clearance of sort of low intensity abandoned chemical stock rather than large stockpiles or uh, facilities? I have uh, one question. You mentioned that uh, the international uh, terrorist groups or uh, non-governmental uh, non actors uh, have made it clear that they want to acquire uh, mass destruction weapons and so do you have any plan that OPCW have any plan to face such challenge, which is a growing challenge nowadays? Thanks. Sure. Well, I'll handle what I can, and I think uh, Jean Pascal will be a useful foil in this respect to supplement my answers. Um, of the six non state parties to the convention, Israel and Myanmar signed. So they're signatories. They need to simply ratify the treaty and be to become full members. Being a signatory does not mean being a member or any sort of privileged status other than showing demonstratively to the international community that you have no problems with that treaty and that you intend to ratify at some point. But until you do, you're not a state party. And until you do, you have no particular privileges or rights. Um, any non-state party can go to the Conference of States Parties of the CWC as an observer. And we actively encourage it. And we like them to see what we do and why it's in their interest to be doing it with us. Um, Israel has sent observers over recent years, um, and they've made statements at the Conference of States parties. Um, the statements don't necessarily say anything about the CWC as much as about the current regional security dynamic uh, um, of the region. And those statements are, of course, available um, uh, publicly on the website. Um, in terms of incentives for Israel, um, well, as I mentioned, uh, you, it's not my position or um, any country's position to uh, talk uh, to, to suggest what is in Israel's security interests. But there are some you know, clear facts that need to be dealt with. I mean, the fact that Syria has been um, chemically demilitarized um, delivers an extraordinary, extraordinary security dividend to Israel and the region. Um, especially given the stated reason that the Assad regime gave for having a chemical arsenal. Uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention delivers uh, clear security benefits um, and, as I mentioned, is a non-discriminatory treaty. Um, the benefits are also economic to some extent. In order to uh, trade in what we call scheduled chemicals, um, it's important to, to have state party status in order to do so without any concerns. For instance, states parties are obliged, uh, they're, they're, they're obliged uh, to declare any trade in so-called Schedule II chemicals, um, which are not the most dangerous, but the second most dangerous, the potential for being a precursor, as outlined by Jean Pascal, to non-states parties. So there are some econ economic benefits there as well, of course. Um, but you know, effectively, and we'll probably discuss this a little bit more in the context of the WMD conference, uh, you know, why CWC is, is, is a treaty worth joining. I mean, the, the, I, there aren't any obvious uh, um, downsides of joining, and quite the contrary, there are upsides. Uh, in relation to Iraq, um, the 
responsibility for destroying chemical weapons rests with possessor states. So um, the only exception has been Syria so far. Um, you might recall, for instance, Albania declared a chemical weapons arsenal that it sort of discovered later in the peace, and it was destroyed in country with American assistance. But effectively, it's the responsibility um, of the possessor state to rid, to, to destroy um, any arsenal or any uh, chemical weapons stockpile. So in relation to Iraq, the same would apply there. Now, the Chemical Weapons Convention doesn't have any provisions for assistance necessarily, but obviously flexible arrangements have come into play in relation to Syria. Um, and whether or not that could form a precedent for the future remains to be seen. I mean, Libya has obviously been very topical in relation to getting rid of um, some uh, component chemicals, some Category 2 chemicals that have been left over uh, from its destruction operations. Um, the Convention does have, as I mentioned uh, briefly in my presentation, provisions for um, assistance and protection, giving assistance and protection to its state's parties. Um, the OPCW works as a coordinating mechanism. For instance, if country A or state party A um, uh, is uh, attacked by chemical weapons by state uh, or if it has an accidental release of uh, toxic chemicals, it can call on the OPCW to help out. And what we would do is co you know, maybe get a regional country or somebody with some uh, uh, capacity to come and help, for example. Um, likewise, we have provisions for assisting victims, I mean, at the request of states' parties, victims of chemical weapons attacks or, or, the, or victims of accidental releases of chemicals, to toxic chemicals. Um, but as I mentioned, the responsibility for destroying chemical weapons resides with possessor states. Uh, Non-state actors, well, I mean, this is an invidious challenge for the organization. I mean, uh, um, I mentioned that current non-proliferation, global non-proliferation norms are not well equipped to deal with state non-state actors, terrorists, simply because they weren't in people's minds when these treaties were negotiated. Um, there's also the added complexity of terrorists not being subject to dissuasion or to um, traditional forms of deterrence. So um, we need to focus on this. I mean, it's multilateral mechanisms have been a little bit less wieldy. I mean, we've had some supplementation in the form of the Security Council Resolution 1540 to deny um, you know, dual-use materials, materials that can be used for weapons purposes, WMD purposes, uh, deny terrorists access to that. Um, we've had various uh, initiatives to uh, counteract financing for terrorists. Um, and of course, we have, outside the multilateral mechanism, we have export control regimes. In the case of chemical and biological substances, there is the Australia Group, which is a, a group of now 42 countries that basically coordinate their export control measures to make sure that um, uh, materials and technologies of potential weapons interest do not go where they shouldn't go, whether to countries of proliferation concern, as they determine, or to um, uh, private individuals and terrorist organizations. Uh, but you know, this is something that we need to focus on. I mean, uh, and, and you know, having countries like Israel and Egypt who uh, inside the Chemical Weapons Convention would be very useful to help inform that process, given um, these countries' direct experience of, of having to deal with uh, terrorists.